Our scripture reading for this day is taken from the gospel according to John, the 20th chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. Before hearing God's word to us this morning, let us go to him in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and everlasting God, we do give you thanks that you have allowed us to gather together in many places to hear your word to us this day in the midst of life. May your Holy Spirit speak to us your words of eternal life, and may we take these words and actually live them through our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen now to and for the word of God as it is given to us in the gospel according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails of my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Here ends our scripture reading for this day. Thanks be to God. Amen. Listen to the word that God has spoken. Listen to the one who is close at hand. Listen to the voice that began creation. Listen even if you don't understand. My Aunt Helen was a person who was kind and gentle. My mother would tell me that her older sister never said anything impolite, with one exception. One day she received a phone call informing her that her brother-in-law, Bill, was going to stop and stay at Helen's for a week. When Helen heard that, she let fly the most vivid of expletives. If you knew my late Uncle Bill, you would understand her reaction. Bill was a very successful lawyer. He became an executive on the board of an international corporation. And in many ways, his life was the classic American dream. He was also the most irritating person I ever met. My uncle would try to dominate the conversation no matter the subject. A contrarian by nature, he had the habit of always taking the other side of an issue even if he hadn't the slightest idea of what that entailed. When you rode with him in his car, he'd stop a mile from your destination and order everybody to walk the rest of the way because he deemed that the exercise would be good for you. For my Uncle Bill, it was always about him and about how he could make people jump at his word. 
unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and place my finger in its mark and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Today's scripture reading is traditional for the first Sunday after Easter, and I usually get called to preach on this date. So I am most familiar with these words of Thomas. Many in our sophisticated age find in this disciple a kindred spirit. Thomas, with his doubts, is one of us. Thomas stands for us. Ironically, despite the labels attached to this scene over the millennia, and even despite your translation for this morning, the word doubt does not appear once in the original text. This isn't about doubting Thomas. It's about contrarian Thomas. It's about controlling Thomas. It's about Thomas wanting to be in charge. Unless I see the nail prints and place my finger in the mark of the nails and in his side, I will not believe. Actually, that word rendered as place really means to throw. Unless I shove my finger into the nail wounds, until, unless I thrust my hand into his side. This language is brutal. It conjures up the image of dissection. Jesus is an object to be probed by Thomas. He's a specimen for Thomas's evaluation, unless I perform the autopsy first. In many ways, Thomas is a poster boy for our generation. His demands here comport to the modern notion that belief is all about assenting to something as long as it fits into your worldview. Check my box, and then I will consent. But unless I am satisfied, I won't agree. Yes, for Thomas, this is all, all about him. You should know that there is a debate among historians over what type of evidence they should accept or discard. In one of my classes, I point out that an ancient writer quotes from a law that he says had been recorded on a public monument. He cites the inscription word for word. Up until the latter part of the 20th century, that information was regarded as being trustworthy. That all changed in the 1990s, when the claim was dismissed by scholars as fiction used only to promote the writer's agenda. And then, lo and behold, archaeologists actually found the inscription, and it confirmed what that writer had said about the object all along. I then show my students other cases where ancient authors quote sources that have disappeared, and I ask them, should we assume that these allusions are correct, or should we dismiss them until the text is found? The vast majority of college students come down squarely on the side of skepticism. I will not believe unless I touch the marble slab. I will not believe unless I feel the letters etched in stone. I will not believe unless... There goes history. While some people might share in Thomas's objections, we need very much to consider the context of his remarks. Whatever the reason he's missing that first Easter evening, Thomas is off on his own. And in his absence, Jesus' followers are huddled in fright and trembling at every sound. Dispirited and devastated, everything that they had hoped for is now seemingly finished. It is to these despairing and, yes, very doubting people, men and women who doubt the meaning of their lives, men and women who doubt all the hopes that they had placed in their leader, men and women who doubt the very justice and mercy of God, as well as men and women who have no doubts about what death is and no doubts about the Romans' expertise in bringing it about. It is in the midst of these people barricaded by doubt and crushed by reality that the risen Jesus suddenly stands. He gives them his peace. He breathes into them the Holy Spirit and commissions them to proclaim the forgiveness and binding of sins. The entire gospel of promise is contained in these words that in and through the resurrected Christ, the world receives the truth that our alienation from God is over, that those who had wandered away from God have been found, 
never to be lost again to the shadows of death. And that with the risen Christ, everything has changed. Everything has changed about the world and for that little band. Everything has changed for that band's relationship to the world. And then, then Thomas finally shows up. The disciples do exactly what they are supposed to do. They proclaim that they have seen the Lord. They report his message to proclaim God's grace and righteousness. They show by word and deed that they're no longer sad, but glad. No longer fearful, but fearless. No longer cowering in some corner, but prepared to go into every corner of the world to people beaten down by life and to declare the truth of the risen and living Christ testifying with their own lives. And to all of that, to the statements of Peter, to the assurances of James and John, to the tears of joy of a Mary Magdalene and the laughter of a Lazarus, Thomas says, I will not believe you, or you, or you, or you, or any of you, unless I am satisfied first. Thomas doesn't doubt. He refuses to believe unless. And this refusal isn't just about the resurrection, but the announcement of a new creation in Christ and everything that entails, his mercy, his forgiveness, his way, his truth, his life, and the very meaning of that life. Back in the second century, Thomas was a popular figure among groups who called themselves Gnostics, a term that meant know-it-alls. Its members portrayed Thomas as having received special information from a Jesus who was a purely spiritual being. This Jesus, the Gnostic Jesus, revealed to Thomas that the God of the Bible was a demon who created the physical world out of malice. This Jesus, the Gnostic Jesus, tells Thomas instead that we are the center of the universe, that salvation lies in our self-exaltation and the knowledge that existence is all about us. It's about me. It's about my self-deification. These teachings are contained in a book, the Gospel of Thomas, a gospel that was not to be preached to the world, but only to a special spiritual elite. Some modern scholars have gone so far as to declare Thomas the fifth gospel on par with the other four. I once told, taught a course on this book, and one day one of my students was extolling Thomas over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so I was curious about it, and I asked her why. And she replied, because Thomas is against unfair hierarchy, she declared. I replied, that the, Goth, that the Gnostics believed they were better than everybody else and they were, the, they were snobs of the highest order. Oh, she hesitated. Well, it promotes feminism. Really, I said, the Gospel of Thomas states that every female must first become a male before receiving illumination. She didn't like that. Well, it stands against the oppressive power of the organized church. I explained that back in the second and third centuries, the Christian church had no political influence among the Romans who were hunting them down. And what goods it had and what organization it possessed went to help the poor, to support widows, to feed orphans. The Gnostics, by contrast, held that to let the impoverished die was doing them a favor so that they could escape the bondage of existence. I asked again, so why do you like the Gospel of Thomas? She mumbled, I guess it's because it isn't traditional Christianity. I will not believe unless. Fans of the Apostle Thomas like to point out that his exclamation, my Lord and my God, is the greatest confession in the Gospels, that it's the doubter who gave the most exalted statement of faith, but when Jesus shows himself to this disciple, his cry is more likely a declaration of repentance. 
Thomas recognizes that the risen Christ is not an object to be classified, not subject to his will and desire, not bound to his condition unless is the revelation of the sovereign God, the saving God. And Thomas, yes, the combative, argumentative Thomas discovers that he's under his saving claim and is to live out that claim. Nevertheless, confronted by the resurrected Savior, Thomas grasps that he isn't in charge at all, but under the merciful charge of Jesus Christ. The New Testament scholar Tom Wright once offered that the Bible and the church's strange claim that Jesus was raised from the dead, that death has no power over him, and that he now lives and reigns, assuring us that because of him, death itself has been and will be overcome for us, that this is something more than just an interesting piece of data. It is a claim, a claim that demands not only our attention, but a decision, not just quick consideration one day while everything returns to what the practical and preoccupied world regards as normal the next. It commands an entire change of worldview for all days. It summons us to faith. It's important to realize that that word faith in Jesus' day indicated allegiance and loyalty and above all else, trust. To believe was to entrust yourself to another and to live out by their guidance and their authority as shown by their deeds. Belief was trusting in the word of another. The Caesars demanded faith with a shadow of a cross over that demand. Jesus Christ invites faith by going to the cross on our behalf. Tyrants threaten death for failing to supply loyalty. Jesus Christ offers life, eternal life, to those who in their weakness and their stumbling place themselves in his care. Eternal life, which is about the abundant quality of God's life revealed in Christ as testified by the scriptures. It's not just about the hereafter, but the here and now about trusting that God has reconciled us to himself in his dear son, restoring to us his wholeness and offering his peace in the midst of so much fear and brokenness. It's about living with forgiveness in an age that more and more demands endless vengeance. And it's about living by the word in and as and through Christ in an age that is all about me. Thomas discovers that it is not about him at all. It's about the resurrected and living Christ who is my Lord and my God, whether Thomas believes those changed and transformed around him or not, whether Thomas himself chooses to believe it or not, whether Thomas has seen him or not. Jesus Christ is this very one, this very Lord and this very God, who bears the marks of his loving faithfulness in his very being forever for us. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, and believing have life, the life in his name. No, it's not about Thomas's doubt. It's about our decision to trust in God's decision for us in his dear son. There's no doubt about that. Amen.